Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Board of Certifications Care Educational Series. My name is Shannon Fleming and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, I have just a few announcements. I would like to take this opportunity to remind you of AT Regulatory Connect, the secure portal for state regulators. AT Regulatory Connect provides regulators access to certification verifications, the regulatory network, the disciplinary action exchange, and many resources. As you may have heard, the CARE Conference 2021 has been postponed to July 2022. CARE Conference 2022 will be held in Omaha, Nebraska, July 15th through the 16th at the Omaha Marriott Downtown Capital District. In lieu of an in-person conference this year, the BOC is hosting an educational series of articles and webinars. Please visit the BOC website to review previous topics and articles. We hope you will join us for the next webinar scheduled for June 9th on the topic, and the topic will be telehealth. Today's webinar is titled Occupational License Portability. Please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A feature. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded. Our presenter today is Dan Logsdon. Dan is the director of the National Center for Interstate Compacts at the Council of State Governments. Previously, Logston was vice chair of Kentucky's Public Service Commission. He served as Kentucky Governor Steve Bashir's deputy chief of staff and as assistant Kentucky state treasurer. He has experience in the telecommunications industry, having served as vice president for external affairs at Alltel Communications and Windstream Communications. He holds a bachelor of arts degree in history from Murray State University. Welcome, Dan. Oh, hey, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, thanks everyone for <clears throat> having me here today. I was telling Shannon before we got started, um, uh, uh, the CSG has been a part of a, a couple of large Department of Labor grants. Um, uh, and we've had some consortium meetings with states and you invite all kinds of people in to talk about licensure. And I was telling her the story at a meeting in Tucson, uh, one of these groups that don't believe in licensure got up and said, um, you know, why do we license some of these professions like athletic trainers? Why, why do we license athletic trainers? And I was sitting with the state of Indiana and, one, and a nurse got up and she said, I'd, I'd like them licensed because they touch my kids. Um, uh, and that kind of shut down the argument there. But uh, there are those elements out there that don't believe in occupational licensure that believe that you can get a, a, a surgeon off Yelp and that'll be just fine. But um, I do believe it serves a purpose. Certainly, uh, no one would argue that uh, when you look at the licensure system as a whole, uh, it makes a lot of sense for some professions. But um, look, it's there to protect the public. As a friend of mine says, um, the only reason you license uh, a profession is so that you can take that license away from an individual that's not performing properly. So um, excited to be here with you all today. Don't worry, I'm not going to kill you with interstate compact stuff, although we are going to talk about it because it is a means that states are using. But a little bit about the Council of State Governments before we get started. So uh, we are a membership organization for, for, uh, for states. Uh, every state's a member, every state pays dues. We um, are nonpartisan, nonprofit. Um, uh, we are uh, uh, data-driven and research-based. Uh, we um, have uh, our home offices in Lexington, Kentucky. We were founded in 1933 at the University of Chicago. Uh, we moved to Lexington in 1967 because we were running out of space at the University of Chicago and uh, RFP went out to the states and Kentucky gave uh, CSG the best deal. So that's why they're there. We've got four regional legislative exchange organizations and then the CSG Justice Center does work with um, states and the federal government uh, looking at reform uh, and uh, other aspects of the criminal justice system. So um, again, thanks for having me today. And let's go to the first slide there, uh, Shannon. Really appreciate that. All right, and then so, uh, you know, what we're seeing out in the states as far as occupational licensure goes, and you all are probably seeing the same thing. Um, I'll get into specifics as we move forward, but you know, when you look at specific populations, um, um, states are trying, especially around military spouses, um, they, you know, 
you've seen, you know, fee waivers and, and they're doing some sort of licensure by endorsement or they've got a special license for that group. Um, there are certainly, uh, especially during the, the pandemic, you've seen a lot of temporary licensure issues or especially a lot of uh, uh, liberal policies when you look at telehealth. Uh, and then some states have even started to give temporary license during pending requirements, especially if you move from another state uh, where you've had licensure. Uh, and again, military populations, veterans, military spouses are benefits of this, recent immigrants with work authorization, and then some highly mobile professions uh, can benefit from that um, as well. Uh, and then from a, a profession specific standpoint, um, you know, you do see a lot of states looking at reciprocity agreements. Over the years that we found those frankly don't work very well. Um, it's really no one's fault, but it's um, uh, a lot of people don't know they're there. Um, legislatures pass them. They don't give the boards a lot of direction on how to implement them. And, you know, so when a practitioner shows up and want to take advantage uh, of one of those, it's hit or miss in some states how available those are. And again, you know, no one's trying to hide the ball, but uh, if you don't deal with those things very much uh, and, and it doesn't have the statutory support or, or something in rules, it makes it more difficult and folks just find it easier to go through the traditional licensure process. Um, and then certainly interstate compacts. I'll talk about some of those aspects later. Since January of 2016, you've seen uh, 151 now separate pieces of compact legislation enacted by the states. Um, there are uh, licensure compacts for physicians and nurses, physical therapists, psychologists, EMS personnel that covers non-gubernatorial declared emergencies. Gubernatorial declared emergencies are con covered under another compact called the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. Um, speech pathologists and audiologists, they just got their 10th member state, which allows them to stand up their interstate commission. We're working with uh, OTs and uh, occupational therapists in the counseling profession. Uh, and uh, the Advanced Practice Nursing Compact is now back, after, back out to the states uh, after um, uh, some work uh, by the National Council of the State Boards of Nursing. Um, in 2020, the Council of State Governments signed a cooperative agreement with the Department of Defense uh, to work on even more licensure compacts. So we're currently um, pursuing compacts for massage therapy, um, social work, teaching, which is going to be a big one. That's teaching and cosmetology are in that group. Those are the first two licensure compacts outside health or allied health. And I always forget, oh, dentistry. So uh, dentistry, we're gonna start working on later this year, but the Department of Defense likes interstate compacts because of the, um, uh, the language in the compact is statutorily based and um, all the licensure compacts have very good provisions for military spouses. That's why they chose to pursue these. Um, they're trying to hit professions with large uh, populations of, of military spouses. So we're excited to be working on them with that project. Um, and then again, you're seeing more and more licensure board engagement with the legislature. Sometimes I think that goes backward. It's the legislature is trying to engage with the licensure board, especially around these universal uh, licensure bills that you see popping up all, all over the country. So next slide, please. Okay, and then so um, these reciprocity and universal licensure laws, you, you have seen more and more states pursue them. Uh, this map's about a, two weeks old and it's probably out of date at this point. Um, I think Arizona was the first one to do this. There's some disagreement about whether, frankly, it's constitutional. I'm not an attorney. I'll let others have that argument about, you know, Arizona actually requires you to, to change your state of residence to Arizona. So you're a, you know, you're a licensed athletic trainer in Texas and you decide to move uh, to Arizona. Um, you know, the legislature and the governor have directed the Arizona board through statute, um, to um, provide you with a license if your requirements are somewhat the same. Um, you know, if, if, if you don't come from a state that, where there's a wide variance in your requirements. Um, and from that standpoint, you've seen other states take up that charge. Uh, some states have had a couple of cracks at this. So Missouri um, and some states aren't requiring that move, right? So uh, in Missouri, I can just, you know, take my Kentucky license to be a physical therapist and go to Missouri and, you know, they'll give me a license uh, to be a physical therapist in Missouri. Um, it, the legislature really wants it to be that easy. Um, they uh, Initially, they did have some sort of um, uh, 
requirements around, you know, it had to be similar. And what they saw was most folks weren't, weren't using it. Um, I think they felt like the board was, um, uh, uh, the state boards were not um, implementing it properly. I think the state boards were doing the best they could to implement it. And, you know, they changed that now. And so I think, you know, from what we've seen, it's essentially an automatic requirement. Um, but that's the one thing where it's kind of tailing off is some states are still requiring residency change. Some states aren't. Um, again, you know, you're giving somebody a license. So, you know, you do have that sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, touch on them, if you will. But, uh, you know, uh, you're really not doing the sort of traditional things that you do to give someone a license. I think some states, if there's a background check, um, you're seeing these. Um, you know, there's there's fees associated with that. If there's uh, 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 any sort of application process, they still do that. I think COVID um, has sort of um, is is going to speed up uh, the adoption of some of these, or at least states' review of some of these. And you know, I hope that some sanity will come into play because. You know, I was talking with the Federation of State Medical Boards about this, you know, the, the narrative that's taking hold out in the country is that, well, look, we, we loosened up all these license requirements during COVID and nothing bad happened. Well, frankly, we don't know yet if something bad happened or not, and we're not going to know for a while. And I think just to assume everything was great uh, and folks got the kind of quality of care um, uh, that they're used to or that they were getting pre-pandemic, um, uh, th there's no data to, to back that up. So um, that's something that, you know, we're encouraging legislators to, you know, take a hard look at this before you just assume the pandemic uh, instituted this sort of regime and everything worked out really well. Uh, but then universal license has been uh, passed in some form in about 12 states. I highlighted uh, this feature down here, a state telehealth registries. Florida's had a state telehealth registry for a couple of years. So if you want to provide telehealth as a psychologist or a counselor or whatever, uh, Florida's got a process where you can register with the state and then provide that. Arizona passed a similar law now. So I think you're going to see more and more states start looking at these. Again, uh, my concern from a public um, um, uh, from a public protection uh, um, aspect, you know, uh, taking a look from the public uh, protection aspect of this is that, you know, uh, essentially all I can do as a state board then is is pull that person's registration. But I, what other means do I have to, to, to deal with them if they're in Florida or they're here in Arizona and they're running afoul of our Practice Act? Um, uh, you know, uh, folks believe in naturally that, you know, hey, I have a competency in this. Uh, ethically, I believe I can engage in this type of therapy, so I'm going to engage in it. The problem is that, you know, the state you want to practice that in, they, their practice act doesn't allow it. What sort of mechanism is in place to inform you of that? So, um, uh, but again, states, um, uh, uh, legislatures especially now want to take a hard look at occupational licensing and where um, they can uh, loosen up the, the, the provisions and, and the requirements. Uh, they're going down that road. You all obviously see that. Let's go to the next slide. And then again, so looking at this, um, the universal licensure law, which is really the hot thing right now um, uh, out there as far as occupational licensure goes. Um, four states require at least one year of experience. Three states don't require any minimum amount. Um, three states allow the licensing board to, you know, to determine if you have the minimum experience. And then again, two states require that an applicant have practice in a profession for a certain period of time. But what you're seeing more and more is um, legislatures are trying to take the subjectivity out of it, um, uh, which, you know, frankly, could hamper a board's ability to regulate the profession. Um, you know, seven states include a scope of practice and or practice equivalency. You know, there's the, the, the note about Idaho that they allow an applicant the ability to receive a limited license and scope of practice. So, you know, uh, again, they can be adaptive. Um, and then five states don't specific, excuse me, specifically address scope of practice um, or practice level comparisons. Th that could potentially um, uh, be an issue. Uh, and let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, and then, you know, again, more on the experience requirements, um, uh, you know, six states apply for universal licensure recognition policies, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, uh, certainly everyone in the, leg you know, I understand why legislators want to sometimes uh, loosen these requirements, um, uh, but uh, again, I think it's probably best to let, let, let the boards deal with um, um, uh, policies around around those types of things. 10 states exempt reciprocity agreements or interstate compacts. We advocate for that. We think these things, and I've got a slide coming up. 
interstate compacts can peacefully coexist with universal licensure or anything else, but it is nice if they exempt those. The nursing compact actually needs that. Um, the nursing uh, state nursing boards that are in the compact have two types of license. So you can get a single state license where you only practice in the state, or you can get a multi-state license that allows you to go to any other of the other compact member states. Um, so if you move to um, a state with one of these univer universal licensure laws, the nursing compact likes to make sure that, you know, you, you really can't just exchange one multi-state license for another state's multi-state license. There needs to be a process around that. So, so you, you've seen the nursing boards involved in this, especially initially in Arizona, just to make sure they're not trying to get in the way of it, but um, they're just trying to make sure that, you know, one, you can't exchange your single state license from one state for a multi-state license. And if you still want to participate in the compact, the compact requires that if you've changed your state of residence, then, you know, there's a process under the compact that you need to comply with. Um, let's see, and then two states do not have language for their policies with specifically exempt uh, reciprocity agreements or interstate compacts. That's not a deal breaker, but, but we do encourage states, if you've joined a few compacts, it's probably good if you're going to pass this law now um, to deal with these things. Um, uh, and, and it's not that you're exempting, you're just sort of saying this won't get into the way of, um, of your ability to participate in these compacts or to join these compacts. And then the other requirements there, again, um, what you're seeing now is boards that are passing these after the first initial round of PASHER was, again, they're trying to take all the subjectivity out of it um, and then essentially just make it a, a trade-off. I, I think you're seeing a lot of pushback from state boards and regulators to say, you know, you got to you got to give us the ability to continue to do what we do regardless of where someone lives. And if they're going to be practicing here, you, we, we need to, uh, you know, you put these laws on the books. We're trying to carry out these laws, um, you know, it's it's not that we want veto power, but you got to give us the ability to actually regulate the profession as you've as you've charged us with doing. Uh, and I I think states will be responsive to that, but again, uh, some states more than others. Uh, so let's go to the next uh, slide there. Oh, okay, yeah, and this is a slide that we've got put together. Uh, we put together a resource. I can share that with Shannon if you guys want it. We're going to update it for later this year. Again, what we're trying to tell legislators. I ran into this. Uh, in Utah, actually, this year, Utah has passed six of these occupational licensure compacts. Um, uh, the OT compact was up for consideration, and you know, uh, it went to a, a committee in the House that was chaired by someone who passed a universal licensure law last year. And the representative said, "You know, we just don't need to do these anymore. I fixed all this last year with my bill." And you know, yes, you know, Utah is very progressive when it comes to universal licensure reform, and certainly. Um, again, these universal uh, uh, recognition laws are uh, can coexist with compacts, but I don't think uh, in in the professions that have them, um, you know, it's an equal sort of match. I mean, you want to make sure um, that professionals um, uh, that are operating in your state, you know, there can be some sort of accountability if they run afoul of the board or if they injure a patient. And you know, again, not all professions need to have an interstate compact, need that sort of heightened level of public protection, but some do. I certainly think medicine and, and uh, nursing, you know, the mental health professions, uh, you know, PT and OT, you know, they can do a lot of damage to a patient. And so, you know, um, that heightened public protection that provides that sort of modified borderless practice is important. So uh, what we're trying to do with this document is, is reinforce to legislators that look, one doesn't supplant the other, um, you know, you don't just want to, you know, pass a lot of compacts and not do anything else for other professions that really don't warrant an interstate compact or, or, or don't desire an interstate, interstate compact. But at the same time, passing a universal licensure, universal recognition doesn't negate uh, your need to, you know, have that sort of heightened uh, uh, public protection that a compact can provide if you've got folks practicing in here from other states uh, through the compact. Uh, so that's, you know, universal licensure is something that, that I think you're going to see more and more states look at. I know that there's, uh, again, the, the document that we had at 12 states, I think that's probably increased in the last couple of weeks, and we'll see in June where it ultimately ends up. Um, but again, uh, I, for, for certain professions, we do believe compacts are the best way to go. There's a lot of talk about licensure by endorsement. Again, you know, that that that's terrific. I think you have to give state boards something to grab onto. That's what you know, concerns folks that I talk with about these registries. If, um, you know, uh, if my only means to deal with someone is to throw them off a registry, 
you know, okay, I'll do that. But what if I, you know, what if they've harmed a patient? I mean, you know, and they're from, you know, uh, Mississippi, you know, this is Florida. I mean, what sort of mechanism do I have to, to deal with that professional? And so, uh, you know, that's the things that, you know, um, uh, legislators have the luxury of not thinking through. They've charged the boards with thinking that, about that. And so, you know, uh, we encourage them to, to listen to their professionals who they've uh, statutorily authorized to, to regulate this profession. Uh, all right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, and then to that end, so now we're going to, I'll go briefly over these compacts. I, uh, you know, uh, disclaimer, you know, I do run the Interstate Compact Center at CSG, but, you know, we don't go out and sell interstate compacts. If professions are interested, great. I don't think every profession needs an interstate compact. Um, you know, we, we have, we've had talks with professions before that were either too small or concentrated in too few states that it really didn't make sense. What we encouraged them to do was, you know, convene their state licensing boards and, and try to work out some, some robust reciprocity among those states uh, like accounting or like um, uh, architecture. Now, you know, for those two professions, it's taken decades to do that. But I think, you know, one of the reasons is that there's, there's not been this sort of um, uh, impetus out in the states that there is now to, to, to sort of loosen some restrictions around licensure portability. But regardless, if, you know, a profession does want an interstate compact uh, and we think they, you know, meet a, a certain level and can support it, then, then we're more than willing to work with them. Uh, and again, that's what our whole effort with the Department of Defense is about. Um, uh, we'll have another round of applications for that funding um, uh, early next year. So, um, you know, compacts are embedded in statute. Um, you know, they allow states to, you know, set their own priorities over, over strictly what the federal government wants. They're really a way for states to stave off um, uh, uh, in, in occupational licensure, to stave off national licensure. There's still a movement in, at the federal level to look at, at how states license professions. There's still a lot of confusion. I think the only thing that the Trump administration and the Obama administration ever agreed on was that they were both fairly skeptical about how states were licensing professions. And so, that's not going away. Um, we think compacts can be a way to sort of stave that off for some professions. Um, but the federal government about in the wake of, I think NC Dental started asking some tough questions to states about how they regulated professions and why they regulated professions. And frankly, you know, the states didn't have very good answers. Uh, there are very good answers, but, but they just didn't have those readily available. And so um, again, CSG, the National Council or National Conference of State Legislatures and the National Governors Association uh, we've been working together with the Department of Labor on a couple of large grant projects to, to you know, uh, bring best practices to states, to elevate best practices to states, uh, to work with certain consortiums of states to, to try to demonstrate how reform might work and interstate compacts is a part of that. So let's go to the next slide. Um, you know, uh, states, uh, again, join compacts for, for uh, lots of reasons. They're not just in the sphere of occupational licensure. Every state belongs roughly to about 24 interstate compacts. It's just now states are starting to use them for um, occupational licensure. In 20 years, they'll be using them. Uh, so, something else will be dominating that field. Uh, but again, uh, the main driver is that they don't want a federal solution. Um, also that, you know, uh, when you look at occupational licensure, there's no role for the federal government in occupational licensure. That's something that the Constitution is explicitly left um, or implicitly left to the states uh, and the federal government really shouldn't be involved in that if they want to take a look at it. That's obviously within their purview. But um, again, um, uh, uh, that threat of a federally mandated solution or the state's ability to come around uh, a problem and deal with it themselves is, is the main driver for interstate compacts. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and then, you know, the benefits for profession, uh, you know, you get agreement on a set of universe, uh, uniform licensure requirements. Now, you know, that can take a different flavor for uh, uh, the compacts, you know, PT and OT, uh, because they've spent decades lining up the requirements out in the states can just essentially say, you know, we're going to ask everyone to trust each other. And, you know, if you've got a license in this state, it gets you into the compact and you can practice in my state and vice versa. Uh, some state, some professions like uh, speech pathology, audiology, nursing, you know, medicine, there's a list of requirements, basic requirements that you have to meet before uh, a, a professional can get into the compact. Um, 
you know, the compact data system. I mean, again, the whole point of an interstate compact is not only to present to a profession, you know, this sort of modified borderless practice, but it's also to, you know, raise the bar a, a little uh, as far as public protection goes. And, and that, that compact data system is certainly something that drives that. Um, you know, disciplinary issues are covered under this. I mentioned that registry, um, you know, that some states might, some state boards might struggle with that, yes, they can take you off the registry, but, you know, uh, then what do they have to do with you? And I know state boards typically try to help each other out. Um, you know, so I'm sure if I was uh, on the Florida board and we were investigating someone that came in under that registry, that state board would, would probably work in every way it could to help me uh, until it became cost prohibitive. But under the compact, all those issues are worked through and, and there's statutory language around that. Um, you know, they all require an FBI fingerprint based criminal background check. Again, there's not a high bar uh, to get into a compact, but there's an elevated bar. Um, you know, they all have that interstate commission. Uh, and then again, you know, the states participate in rulemaking, uh, you know, interstate compact commissions, these interstate compacts, they're instrumentalities of the states. So the states ultimately have control, uh, not anyone else. And so the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, we mentioned the data system, the, the uniform language, um, you know, I think now we're starting to get to where we say this, they have a proven track record. Uh, you've got three compacts, PT, uh, nursing and uh, medicine that have over 30 states uh, joining them. Um, you've got um, uh, speech pathology and audiology with, um, it just got its 10th member state. OT could get 10 member states this year. Uh, uh, CIPAC and, and the EMS compact are both over 20. So again, states are responding to this idea. Most states are responding to this idea. Um, uh, but again, I don't think they're for every profession, uh, and certainly um, um, uh, if, if a profession, you know, can't support the, the implementation of the compact, uh, that, that's going to be difficult for them to, to enter into this space. And let's go to the next slide. Okay, and then specifically around healthcare reciprocity, what we've heard from, from the, the professions that we work with is, you know, we are becoming a more mobile society. Uh, that's not only for patients, but for practitioners. Uh, I think, um, you know, when uh, practitioners especially come out of a school setting, I don't think um, they understand that they have to get licensed until late into the process. And so, um, you know, uh, they don't understand that I'm going to have to be tied to a certain place. I just can't take my degree and go everywhere and practice everywhere I want to. So, um, you know, professions want to do something um, for their practitioners and then, it, you know, access to care issue, it does benefit patients. Again, military spouses, all these compacts have robust language to address issues for military spouses. Uh, access to care, we mentioned. I think it enhances the state's ability to protect uh, the public because, you know, um, all the compact member states have agreed that they're going to coordinate and cooperate if there's an investigation and that's all backed up by the compact data system that, that houses that information. Uh, they all exchange and share when relevant and, and, and when allowed, you know, investigatory information. Um, when you're looking, especially at telehealth, uh, you know, I think we're about to see largely because of the pandemic, but, you know, I think it was coming anyway, you're going to see an explosion in telehealth. And I think compacts are a better way to address public health concern or public protection concerns um, uh, than any other means uh, available uh, to, to regulators. Um, uh, again, a, rising populations for seniors and veterans that gets back to uh, uh, access to care issues. And, and then again, I think you're starting to see, I know for some professions, um, they want to use the fact that their profession has an interstate compact. You really see this come from membership organizations. They want to promote the fact that they have an interstate compact for their profession as a means to draw people into uh, the profession. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then again, so here's what we're looking at currently. Um, the Physician's Assistance Compact there at the bottom, uh, CSG is working with the Federation of State Medical Boards uh, to facilitate that compact. Uh, FSMB received a HRSA grant to create this compact, so they, they, they uh, reached out to us and we're working with them on that project, but they're, they're the lead. Um, a, um, a draft, um, a loose draft of a compact that we, um, had, uh, went out to the states recently for their feedback. Um, we've had to adapt how we typically build these things um, because of the pandemic. Typically, we meet in person a few times and, and, and hammer all these issues out. We've had to do that virtually, and, and so it's made it a little bit more difficult, but there is sort of a draft uh, 
document out to the states for for their review. Um, and I expect that compact to be finished sometime uh, in mid to late 2022, and probably the states will be looking at that in 2023. Um, again, we mentioned the medical compact at 30, PT at 33, nursing at um, at 34, um, uh, and then the advanced practice registered nurse compact that went back out to the states this year. So I think North Dakota rejoined that compact. Um, but again, uh, occupational therapy and counseling. Um, you know, they just went to the legislatures this year. Um, OT will probably end up, it could get its 10 state threshold this year, but it's probably more likely to get eight or nine. And then the counseling compact, we didn't finish that until late December, but even with that, um, we've had two states already join it. And I think we'll have one more uh, in this legislative session. So I expect it'll get its 10th member state and begin the process to be standing up uh, sometime next year. So, um, and then when you combine that with what we've got with the Department of Defense uh, funding. So you're gonna see um, massage therapy, social work, dentistry, cosmetology and teaching come on board here. And then again, we've got another round of application uh, that we'll, we'll be uh, highlighting uh, first quarter of next year. So uh, under the funding from DOD, we're uh, gonna do 10 of these licensure compacts. So um, again, you know, they're difficult to do, they can be expensive. Um, uh, but it, they're built to last, and we think, you know, uh, they're a great means for public protection if you're practicing across state lines. Uh, next slide. I think so. Yeah. And then I just, uh, and I, I Shannon, I'm, I'm with hope you can share these slides. So um, uh, we built in these links here um, uh, that we developed uh, these resources as our, uh, with our work on uh, our occupational licensure um, uh, projects with the Department of uh, Labor. Um, the initial one uh, ended it, uh, on December 31st of uh, last year. That was led by the National C uh, Conference of State Legislature, CSG and NGA, the National Governors Association uh, were partners on that. And then uh, in 2018, we, uh, there was another grant that uh, we worked on uh, uh, that ends this year with NCSL. So you know, they got a part of it and we got a part of it. Uh, we're developing resources for that. But uh, if you want to get on our uh, website uh, uh, at, uh, at there and pull these resources, um, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, good information there. And if there's things there that uh, you would like to see, please reach out to us. We'll be happy uh, to try to try to address those in, in, in some future documents. If there's webinars or, or some educational materials that you think we ought to provide uh, to you, we'd again, love to talk to you about, about doing that. And I think maybe that's it, Shannon. So happy to, yeah, so happy to take any questions that you all have and appreciate, uh, you, again, you having me on today. Uh, this is a fascinating area. Um, uh, legislators, my our uh, our CEO uh, tells me uh, from time to time whenever we get to speak, which is rare nowadays, but that he's always surprised when he visits states that um, you know legislators and folks in the executive branch want to talk about occupational licensure. So it, it really is a subject that's not going away. And again, uh, um, there's a lot of good things happening out there. Legislatures are are doing a lot of good things. Um, um, uh, I think uh, interstate compacts are a part of that, but certainly there's other things that they're doing. And um, uh, what we wanna do is be a resource for states so that they can make informed decision, look at best practices, look at, look at what's worked in other states um, before adopting policies. And I'm gonna get a drink. Well, thank you, Dan. We appreciate your, your information. Uh, at this time, we will take any questions um, that anyone may have. If you could just type those into the question and answer feature um, on the Zoom platform there. <clears throat> so uh, I guess one question was, since we have uh, regulators on the call, um, you know, what, what kind of role do those regulators play in an interstate compact? Yeah. Um a huge role. So, um, you know, regulators are charged with implementing uh, uh, the compacts and typically the interstate commission is made up of regulators. So I know for the two compacts that we finished up last year for the counseling profession and the occupational therapy profession, um, you know, uh, they both um, uh, pull the membership from the, uh, excuse me, the membership from for the interstate commission from state boards, it's typically board administrators. Also, when we're creating these compacts, 
um, you know, we pull state boards um, into the process. So um, about for the projects that we're doing right now for the Department of Defense, about the technical assistance group, uh, the advisory group that we convene to start the process um, of creating an interstate compact. Um, about half those folks come from state boards. Um, for the drafting team, which is the next step when you actually write the compact, again, we want state board folks in the room because, I mean, this is essentially a regulatory document. This is a, this is a, a, a document that state boards are going to not only have to implement, uh, and, and get stood up if their state joins, but you know they'll play a part in the rules and the bylaws. So you know we need to make informed decisions. These licensure compacts are really a reflection of what's going on in the states, uh, in, in the state regulatory environment. So um, you know certainly you'll have um, um, sometimes they'll be built into a compact like a stretch goal for 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 states in their current regulatory makeup but it's 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 typically just a reflection of what states do you don't want to um you know we can't work compacts thrive on these licensure compacts especially they they thrive on uniformity so if a profession comes to us and they're only licensed in about half the states you know uh, that's I don't know, we can't really do anything with that. Now, if a broad coalition of state boards and a membership organization and practitioners came to us and say, said, hey, you know, we want we want an interstate compact because we want to drive licensure in other states that don't have it, you know, I, I would tell them to go do that first and then come back and do the interstate compact. You really don't want to use the compact to drive uh, other states to license a profession that they've chose not to, to license. So it's really, you know, that uniformity is what what makes these compacts possible. So, you know, uh, for the speech pathology and audiology compact, you know, uh, there was a discussion about whether or not we ought to include audiology assistance and speech pathology assistance. And, you know, ultimately, the answer was we couldn't include them, not because there wasn't a willingness to, but because there's essentially 50 different ways that states are regulating that profession. And so there's just absolutely no uniformity for us to grasp onto to build that compact. And, and so, um, um, you know, when, when you look at, at, at uh, uh, the role that regulators uh, play in their states, they essentially play that role on the interstate commission. It's just now um, more national in scope when looking at, at, at portability and reciprocity for these professions. Because again, if I'm a practitioner, and I'm using the compact to come into your state. When I'm there, either via telehealth or in person, I'm under your authority. So if your practice act, um, or so you know, I have to adhere to your practice act. Uh, the compact says that explicitly. Uh, all these compacts say that explicitly. So um, you know, I won't have a defense before the board if I get pulled in and I say, well, you know, my state allows me to do that, and I have a competency in it, so ethically I can engage in it. It's like, well. We don't allow it, and the compact explicitly states that you're going to adhere to our rules, and so, you know, there goes your compact privilege. So, um, again, we I like these licensure compacts because they preserve state authority. CSG believes in federalism. We believe that states ought to have the authority to control um, um, what happens inside their boundary to, to, to a certain extent, um, um, and these, these licensure compacts do preserve that. Thanks, Dan. I do have one question. Uh, can you explain the costs involved with being in the compact? I know states have to pay an annual fee to support the commission. Yeah, some some compacts require that, some don't, but they all have that provision. Yeah, look, um, you know, they're not cheap and and they're 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 not easy to do. Although with the licensure compacts, they're getting a little bit easier uh, because you know. Um, you can't just pull the PT compact down and everywhere it says PT insert occupational therapist. But if you looked at those two compacts, we borrowed heavily from what PT did because we knew it worked. And especially when you look at the last portion, last half of these compacts, when you start standing up the commission and the data system, that's essentially just boilerplate language that looks the same in about all these licensure compacts. But yeah, um, you know, the, the big ticket item for the commission is that data system and those those can be expensive, um, certainly. Um, I think states get a tremendous benefit from 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 those systems, but you know that that is that is something that typically costs over a million dollars. Again, those costs are starting to trickle down as more professions get into this space, state uh, uh, space. But that's 
that's an expensive item. Uh, again, all these licensure compacts require uh, or allow for a state assessment, but right now only nursing and SIPAC are assessing states. Nursing assesses states a flat $6,000 fee every year. Um, SIPAC has a sliding scale based on the number of privileges issued in your state. I haven't heard this uh, stated uh, outright, but but w what I've garnered in, as I've been working on these and talking to legislators is that they're more than willing to give certain professions this sort of modified borderless practice, but what they're really not interested in is paying for it. So, um, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, that cost has to be borne somewhere. Uh, you've seen for PT, the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy, uh, for nursing, you've seen the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. For SIPAC, you've seen the Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards. You know, they've taken on uh, the obligation to, to uh, assist with the creation of the database and then, you know, house the interstate commission. These interstate commissions aren't very staff heavy. They typically have one or two employees, but still, uh, you know, those organizations uh, have, have, uh, have helped with that. But yeah, um, uh, certainly, you um, um, they do have a means to assess the states. Uh, so far, states haven't been willing to, to pay an exorbitant amount. Uh, you know, I, it'd be hard to for, for a compact to assess the states more than what nursing assesses um, uh, and get away with it. So, but, you know, yes, the, they have that ability. And at some point, I think states are going to need to get more involved in funding them as more of them come online, uh, because I think states are gaining a practical benefit from that and they have an obligation to help pay for that. But you're right, um, um, you know, there is a cost associated with them. Thanks, uh, some more questions regarding the uh, drafting. So are there specific qualifications to be on the drafting team? Who selects um, that drafting team? Um, so, uh, you know, CSG ultimately selects the drafting team. Um, uh, the group, the groups that we're working with make recommendations to us or they nominate people. Um, you know, what we want is, um, what's great is if you've got a couple of good state board attorneys or AGs that we can pull in, um, you definitely want, you know, a board administrator or somebody that works with the board in the room. Uh, that's dealt with statutory language before that's always helpful and then and then you know i think it's always helpful to have a practitioner in the room um who can kind of bring everybody back and, and center everyone about why we're here you know some people and look there's it, it is what it is but you know uh, if i'm a practitioner and i've got licenses in five states you know that's a lot of work you know now you know uh, I knew it was going to be a lot of work before I did it, so I, I don't really have a right to complain, but if there's a means available for me to sort of wet, lessen that workload and still allow the state to protect the public, then, you know, let's let's go for that. But And then CSG supplies the rest of the folks, uh, myself, uh, staff that work with me, and then our attorneys um, uh, to build this document. And uh, then it goes back to the advisory group. They look at it. Uh, after they look at it, it goes out for stakeholder review. So we'll spend two to three months socializing the document with um, uh, anyone and everyone that wants to comment on it. Um, uh, you know, we'll hold webinars and walk through it, explain what it is. We'll take all that feedback. We compile it. We catalog it. The drafting team gets back together. They review all that. They may change the document based on that. Um, and then all of that information, the comments and the new final proposed final draft go back to the advisory group and they sit with it. You know, the, you know, there may have been some suggestions that the drafting team didn't take, but the advisory group feels really strongly that should be incorporated into the document and eventually you reach a consensus and, and um, you have a compact. So um, it's not an easy process, uh, but um, uh, you know, it's how we do it. It has to be open and transparent or it won't work. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the unique things about an interstate compact, so it's a contract between and among states. So, you know, once it gets to the legislature, they can't change it substantively. And so that's why we do all the vetting before we get there. So, you know, they feel comfortable that, you know, um, uh, these requirements have been vetted. Uh, our meetings held, uh, Shannon, is the next yep. question, our meetings held virtually? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, we typically don't like to do that. Um, we at least want to hold the first meeting in person um, uh, of, of 
both the groups and it's nice if we can hold the last meetings in person because it's easier to get to that consensus or get down the road to that consensus when uh, folks can look at each other but the work that's done in between uh we always do that remotely just because it's a cost savings measure uh who hires commission staff the interstate commission does that uh, so the interstate commission which is made up of uh, representatives from the states. Uh, these interstate commissions, again, they're instrumentalities of the states. And so um, uh, the, 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 the commission is charged with doing that. Uh, and then how many people are allowed from each state on the draft team? Well, we don't look at it like that. Um, uh, you know, for the advisory group and the drafting team, frankly, you know, uh, we're looking for the smartest people we can get. So um, we're not, uh, you know, uh, the, the drafting team is about six or eight people. The um, uh, advisory group is typically no more than 20. So uh, we like to, uh, you know, keep those numbers where they are. That's why we do so much robust stakeholder review is because, you know, if you, you know, even if you weren't at the table at the advisory group or in the drafting team, you know, you're going to get a, 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 an opportunity to, to talk to us, to work with us, to bring your suggestions forward. Great. I have a question on the commission. Who decides who's on that commission? Is that written um, in the compact yeah. itself? Yeah. So for um, typically, um, I think, in, yeah, for all the existing licensure compacts, and I expect this to go forward, um, the state board appoints. Okay. Very good. Well, and we'd like to give them options, you know, so we'll, we'll, for, I know for um, OT and counseling, typically states just send their board administrators, which is probably the smart thing to do. Um, but we give them an option. They can, they can send a, a, a board member, they can send an administrator, um, uh, or they can send a public member. The next question we have is once the magic number of states have, been, have passed legislation, how soon will privileges be issued? It typically takes 12 to 16 months to stand up the commission. Now, um, what you want to do is start really early um, uh, and some can do this and some can't um, so that, you know, I, I know the, the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy, you know, I think they started preparing for the commission to get stood up uh, the second it went out to the state. So they were pretty quick to be in there um, uh, and allowing uh, and, and standing the commission up. Um, some folks, you know, some some organizations can't do that. And so um, they have to wait till the, it's progressed a little bit, but it's typ typically 12 to 16 months. And, and the biggest component of that is, is getting that data system figured out. That's, that's a big expense. Uh, it's a complicated thing. Um, once you get it, I think, I think everyone's gratified that you have it. And I think it's a huge benefit, not only for regulators, but, but for the public. Um, but, um, you know, that can take a while. And, and identifying the funding for that is something uh, uh, that also complicates things. Uh, but look, um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't like to uh, uh, paint a picture that this is going to be easy. And sometimes I, I veer into making folks think it's impossible. It's not. Other professions have figured it out. That's what we always tell professions. It's like, if you really are desirous of this, we can help you figure all these things out, but you need to go into it with your eyes open. It's, it's not easy. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, next question, do different compacts share data system infrastructure? Well, that's a great question. Uh, right now, no, but as we move forward, I think we're probably going to look to maybe see if we can get some economies of scale. Um, all of them will contain a certain amount of the same information. I mean, you know, the PT compact, the medical compact and the nursing compact ultimately work differently. So the medical compact is expedited licensure. You're actually getting licensed in every state, uh, but the medical compact is doing that work for you. And there's a streamlined set of requirements. Uh, but again, you're actually getting licensed in that state. Um, that's a very expensive model. And that's why, frankly, only physicians uh, have that. Uh, it's about $700 every time you use the medical compact. Half that money goes back to the state. Half of it goes to uh, uh, the commission. Um, the nursing compact works just like your driver's license. So it's a mutual recognition compact. Uh, it's, 
and what that means is the other member states are agreeing that they're all going to mutually recognize the fact that one of its member states has chosen to license you in that state and you know you're in good standing you can you can practice in their state but you know so you go to your home state nursing board you get a multi-state license and boom you can go to any other compact member state and practice when the physician when the physical therapist was developing their compact they're also a mutual recognition compact in that everything's based on your your home state license but the boards wanted a little bit more visibility on who was getting the privileges and where they were even if they don't look at it regularly they know it's there they can look at it um and so they came up with this privilege to practice model which every profession after them has essentially used um uh, the nursing compact um you know no other state has taken that sort of driver's license approach but hey it works for them uh, they're comfortable with it but but no other state has so uh, when you look at those three models there's a lot of the same information that that they collect up um uh you know, so I think there's an opportunity for some economy uh, scale from from that standpoint, but then how ultimately they work on the back end um, is is different. And so, uh, you know, you're still going to have some functionality that, you know, PT needs that nursing doesn't that, you know, medicine uh, also would need. So, uh, but I do think there's an opportunity to build on some of these existing platforms. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um this same person said, I asked because our agency stands to be involved in three different compacts that are in various stages of development. It would be advantageous to our staff to be using one system with varying levels of access. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, someone brought that up to me recently um, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they were looking at having to get into this, this space now and, and start looking at how they were going to fund the data system. So that's a great point and something that um, you know we're going to start looking into. So speaking of funding, so I know that the DOD had the, this funding um, for these professions that applied essentially and you had selected. Uh, is there any plan for funding for database systems? There's a limited amount of money for database systems, yes. Uh, it's not nearly as robust as for the development but there, there is funding available to assist with, with the database implementation, yes. And does your organization play a role in that as well? Yes. Yes, we will run that process. Very good. Okay, are there any more questions? These were all great questions. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, again, thanks for the opportunity. If you'd like more information about any of this, um, Again, we're, we're ready to assist and help. And certainly if you want more information about what DOD is doing or, you know, just interstate compacts in general, uh, you know, we'll be happy to talk with you again. Um, uh, you know, we don't, um, we, we, we certainly think these are good mechanisms, but we recognize that, you know, they're probably not a good fit for every profession, but, you know, if professions want to pursue them, we're ready to help. Thank you again, Dan, uh, for your time today. It's been no, great. thank you all. Uh, we would also like to thank the BOC's Regulatory Affairs Advisory Panel for their guidance. And finally, thank all of you. Uh, we greatly appreciate your participation today. Oh, I did. Uh, uh, Shannon? Yes. I, I'm sorry. I didn't know Missy Anthony was on your board. Um, yeah. Wow. Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> all She's right. She's on our advisory panel. So uh, Miss, Missy's good people. Uh, uh, Missy was actually on the project team for OT. So yeah, and and uh, Missy's on the call. So right. But if you don't like it, sure. blame blame me. It's not Missy's <laughs> fault. It's that's that's on me. Very good. Uh, so um, again, please look for some additional information on the next care educational series opportunity, which again, that's June 9th and invitations will be going out very soon. And we thank you and hope that you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.